Happy Sabbath, everyone. Um, we're going to do a little bit of a review of the presentations that I've done on God's love and, um, and then finish this off. So uh, before when I did the study, I, I had this, the Bible program up there. Um, this one, you're actually looking at my notes. These are sort of sketchy notes. They weren't uh, notes that were um, written. They're just outlines. But uh, anyway, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the Sabbath and for the fellowship that we can have. We ask for your spirit to rest upon us, to be with our loved ones. May your angels watch over them. And may you speak to our hearts. May you teach us. And may we truly understand what it means to trust in you. We know, Lord, that um, there's many difficulties we face in our day-to-day -day life. And that religion and Adventism and this message at times has not reached into the dark recesses of our hearts because um, we've we've resisted uh, the light that you are giving us. And so we ask for forgiveness. We ask that that full light can shine in our hearts, that we can see our sins, that we can trust in you. We're thankful for the various messages that have have been given, the light that you've been given, uh, giving to us. And uh, we know, Lord, that it is at times overwhelming. And, and we all have different minds and different ways of thinking. I'm thankful for the studies on Friday night, the blessings that they can be to each one of us and for these studies here on Sabbath. So we invite your spirit again to be our teacher, to instruct us, in the path of righteousness. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, happy Sabbath again. Now, um, this series that I did on uh, uh, love um, goes way back uh, 2014. I think the one was in 2014, the other one in 2015, something like that, that I presented these. Now, in 2014, um, I, I'd already been in this movement for about four years. And, well, it would be about three and a half at that time when I did this presentation. And then uh, it was another year, I think, until I did the next one um, in Warburg Church. I did presentations. And I do have part one in video on my YouTube page. Uh, Part two, I know was recorded, but I don't know what happened to the video. So uh, I don't have it. Um, but here we have much more light now than we had back then. And in looking at this, uh, we've looked at this in a little more detail. Now, the idea of part one was really showing that God is very different from us. We have a, a contrast between our character and God's character, right? And, and of course, that's really easy to understand. But God is love. That, that's, that's what he is. That's what his substance is, whatever that means. But God is love. He's not, God doesn't just love. He is love. That is the very essence of his being is love. Love exists. It is eternal. And, um, now, if God is love, then we are not love, right? We're actually enmity against God. The carnal mind is enmity against God. In every way, we're contrary to God. And when man tries to address the problem, the problem of sin, um, we have our solutions, and then there's God's solutions. So we know all of sin and come short of the glory of God. Um, he that saith, I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. And all of us can look at ourselves and say, well, we're sinners. And do we really even know God? Right. But these are things, you know, that really are evident. Right. They're things that we should be able to understand and see and know uh, just by our personal experience. And uh, in that first study, I looked at this mirror right in James one, verse twenty three. So even though we can 
we can be a hearer of the word and not a doer. That's like a man who, who looks at his natural face, but he doesn't do anything about it. He can't do anything. It can show him that he has a problem, that his face is dirty. Um, and it can show him, you know, the law can show us that we're sinners. But we don't want to look at that because men love darkness rather than light. And so we look at what man has done to try to solve this sin problem. Right? Can an Ethiopian change his skin or a leopard his thought spots? Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. So we can't change our nature. So that means that the work of salvation is an act of God alone. That is, everything that has been done to save man is from God's prerogative. Man has not done anything to save himself. He can't. He doesn't even really understand what the problem truly is without God. He can't even see that he's a sinner without God. And, and so God has to do something to save us. So we know that what God's solution is, is contrary to what man would want. Right? So man's attempts to solve the sin problem are the result of his nature. So it shouldn't be surprising that God's solution is consistent with and comes forth from his very nature from the fact that he is love. So his solution is love. It's not the solution that we would have, right? Now, God's solution is love, even if we we think it is something else, right? So now to understand this love has been the, the great difficulty of, of religion, of Christianity, of Adventism, because love does things that uh, the person who's being loved may not particularly like. I love my children. I allow my children to suffer the consequences of their choices. They may want to be coddled and pampered and everything be done for them, right? Because they're selfish by nature. But as a loving father, I know that they have to grow, they have to face challenges, they have to have failures. And I will always love them, but love is something, if it's if it's true love, that allows that person to develop and grow and become their, their own selves. Now, there's some people who think they love their children in, in another way. So you have the ones who coddle their children, and, and then you have ones who um, make their li- children's lives miserable. And, and of course, that's not love at all, right? But they don't even show love or kindness or mercy. And they think that that's the best way to raise children. Uh, if anybody has ever read Adventist Home, um, which it's a compilation, I'm not a particular fan of compilations, but in there, if you read it, you will, you will see that, you know, the type of home that we are to have is one that's loving first and foremost. But if, the thing is that that idea of what love is kind of distorted. So so God is going to have this solution that is love. And it's it's going to be demonstrated, of course, uh, by the cross. Um, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So the first thing we see is that Christ takes upon himself our nature. So this God who created everything, who who dwells in eternity. Uh chose to become made as one of his creatures. He took upon himself our nature in its fallen condition. Now his nature is going to be glorified, but it's still going to be our nature, right? He's he's still forever bound to his body, right? Now, of course, Christ has a Holy Spirit, and through the Holy Spirit, he can communicate with us. So his he can be with us through his spirit. But as, as Jesus, who took upon that nature, that flesh, he still dwells in that human nature. And, and this is one of the things that's not really understood. Now, what, the other thing is we know that there is the cross. And so this cross, of course, is not a little piece of gold that you hang around your neck. But it's something that you take up daily in everything that you do. You are submitting to this cross through the fellowship of sufferings with Christ. 
You're yoking up with Christ. You're learning of his meekness and lowliness. But in order for this to happen, we need a revelation of Christ. We need to understand who Christ is. And we are given prophecy, not just the Gospels, but we are given the book of Revelation. We are given the book of Daniel. We are given the whole scriptures. These are all a revelation of Christ. So we, we talk about Christ being our advocate, the comfort of the Holy Spirit, all of this that is done. And we know that uh, there is messages that are the spirit of Antichrist. I'm not going to go into that. Uh, but we know that they that say that Jesus didn't come in the flesh, this is the spirit of an Antichrist. And this spirit exists everywhere that light is rejected. Because we don't want to recognize that we are sinful. Okay, so I'm not going to go into the nature of Christ right now because I've done that a lot. Um, but that's part of what I did in my first presentation. And I talk about the new birth and I'm crucified with Christ because he took my nature. So so those things I don't need to to go through. But that was my first presentation. Um, so a lot of things I'm just going to leave out. But uh, um so I say here, Jesus Christ came in human flesh, sinful flesh, that he might destroy sin. Jesus wants to live in our sinful flesh, live individually in us, so he can destroy sin in our lives as well. This is the new birth. John knew Jesus personally. He walked with him on this earth. He knew his character. John knew his attitude towards, his attitude towards sinners and his attitude towards sin. Jesus loved sinners, but hated sin. Right. And so then I say stuff about this incomplete sermon, blah, blah, blah. Right. So that was my first presentation. Now, uh, the second presentation um, is uh, well, part two. It's going to be here. So I'll go now in this one, I dealt a lot with the law of liberty. So I looked at James um, chapter one, where we talked about this law, this mirror right? A man beholdeth himself and goeth away, right? Etc. And, and what's contrasted in, uh, first Corinthians chapter three. So we looked at those, those are the main verses that we are addressing and looking at second, second Corinthians chapter three. Uh, yeah, where it's going to talk about this law that this, you know, that was glorious, but it's administration of death. And then it talks about looking at the law of liberty, right? And, and to understand this glory in this character. Now, where we're heading in, in part two is, um, you know, that we're changed into the same image from glory to glory. So this is the everlasting gospel. Now, as Seventh day Adventists, we know we have the three angels' messages. That's the everlasting gospel, Revelation chapter 14. And we know that Revelation chapter 18, at least in this movement, is, um, a repeat of the second angel, right? So we know, we know that it's often referred to as the fourth angel or the other angel, but it, it is the second angel's message. It's going to uh, be repeated and join with the third angel. And if the second is repeated, then the first has to be repeated because you can't have a, uh, a third without a first and a second. So you can't have a second without a first. So this is what this movement has it been all about in understanding that these messages are repeated. Now, what we have done is we have taken these messages and we've, we've put them on a line and, and we can say, well, this line is a reform line. And we can look at that line in Millerite history of when the first and second angels messages were given. We can see that that is the parable of the 10 virgins, right? And, and we can understand, well, that's that's Adventist history, and we can look at the details of, of the prophecies that were given. But we know that the purposes of those messages was not really to predict some event, but was to prepare people to receive further light. So with the first and second angels' messages, what were they what light was it that the people were to be prepared to receive? What did they need to be prepared for? Why did they have to go through that experience of the first and second angels' messages? What message did they need to receive? Why, why did they have to be prepared to receive that message? Okay, so that message would be the third angels' message, right? So they, 
they experienced the first and second. Correct. October 22nd, 1844, the third angel's message arrived. Now, even though the third angel's message arrived on October 22nd, 1844, we normally place the third angel in 1888. That is, that the third angel, angel's message was given in 1888, 44 years after it arrived. Now, why is that? Why, why did it take 44 years from October 22nd, 1844 to the third angel's message being given? What, what was happening in that history? Pride. Okay, pride? Is that what you said? Exactly what I said. Okay, so, so we know there was pride. So, so the first and second angel's messages, after, after this parable of the ten virgins was fulfilled, in Millerite history, you know, the first angel's message um, was the going forth of the virgins. And the second angel's message was the tearing of the virgins. And then uh, when the third angel arrives, that's going to be the going the door into the wedding. Right? Christ begins his work on the Day of Atonement. And so you had, you know, 500,000 um, people accepting Miller's message prior to 1843. And. And then you're going to have 50,000 left after, you know, the first disappointment. And then after the, the third disappointment or the second disappointment, when the third angel's message arrives, you're going to, it's going to be whittled down by 19 or 1950, 1850 to about 50 people who had gone through the second angel's message and were still accepting the light of the second angel. Right, the second angel's message were still accepting the light of the midnight cry and believed it to be true. You have about 50 people left. And so, and they're studying God's word. They're, they're putting together this chart, the 1850 chart that's going to establish, um, you know, the sanctuary message. Right. And, and, and also the understanding of the three angels' messages. So one of the things is that when uh, the Millerites are going through the first and second angels messages, they actually don't know that they are right. The, this understanding of the first, second and third angels message is something that comes after the third angels mes message arrives. Right now, it's not quite true because in the history leading up to the first disappointment, there was a recognition that there was a message that Babylon had fallen, had fallen. And so that message, the second angel's message, is being proclaimed during Millerite history. So, so they have some inkling about the second angel's message. But they're not even thinking about the third angel's message. So it, it's kind of peculiar uh, when, you, when you read through, because we have that all in the, the three angel's messages source book, if you read through... Um, how they're understanding things. They're not really looking at uh, the first, second, and third angels' messages in that history, in Millerite history. So, so now we have this third angels' message. And in, in the Friday night studies, we talk about this third angels' message is righteousness by faith in verity. That is, in the reality of the experience of righteousness by faith, that the first angels' message is righteousness by faith. But it's not righteousness by faith in verity. It's it's where a person who's a sinner comes to Christ, confesses sins, and and Christ uh, forgives him of those sins. He removes those sins from him, and he and he covers him with a cloak of righteousness, so that he can stand uh, before God justified. Right? And then the second angel's message is this message of sanctification. This is this daily pro process of justification because I can't just be justified once in the past because I'm a sinner and and I need this work of sanctification this daily justification this taking up my cross daily but the third angel's message has a work that is completing uh this work of righteousness that the glory of the lord is going to be upon that individual in reality that they are going to be Christ-like 
in all respects so that they can stand in the sight of the holy God without a mediator. Now, this is considered last generation theology, and it's considered heresy presently within the Adventist church by the vast majority of our theologians and church leaders and pastors. So the idea that somehow uh, Christ's character has to be perfectly reproduced in his people before he can come is considered fanaticism. Now, there is fanaticism attached to that. To many people who look at this uh, idea, they they don't still don't understand what that idea means. That is, they stand as judges of others who don't believe like they do, because they say they believe in overcoming sin, but they manifest in their characters uh, something that is unchristlike. They shut down others. They argue, and you can see in what uh, Dwight presented this morning of what it, what the message, what the gospel is supposed to do, what the Holy Spirit is supposed to do is to change us so that all of this foolish talk, all of this judging of others, all of this criticisms, all of this selfish centeredness, selfishness is set aside and that, that we end up with a character that reveals God's love. So, um, I'm just in this here dealing with the solution. Uh, I, I have these bullet points here. What is the problem that Paul here presents? Their minds were blinded. Their minds were blinded because of their sin. That is true of us, right? They're unwilling to look upon that which could save them. And again, if they had looked, what would have been the result? They would have died, right? So they can't look upon God's glory. So what's the solution that Paul presented? They need to turn to the Lord. What will then be the result? The veil will be taken away. And what will we then be able to do? With open face, we will be able to behold the glory of the Lord. And what will be the result? We will be changed into the same image. We will see God. How will we see God's law then? We will see it as the law of liberty. We are now in the bondage of sin and death. And how can we move from where we are to where God wants us to be. This last question is really dealing with the final movement, the glory that will lighten the whole earth. This is a revelation of God's character in his people. So we're going to look at these spirit of prophecy quotes. Um, so um, now the message, of course, has already been revealed um, and, and not some... It's not some new message, right? It unfolds, but it's the third angel's message. And and this is the message. It has to do a work to prepare people to proclaim the message, right? So we know that the, the work of the first and second angels is, in Millerite history, to prepare a people to receive a message. In our history, the work of the first and second angel is to prepare a people to proclaim this message, does, does that make sense to people? If it doesn't make sense, let me know. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. So here are some st statements. So this one in Life Sketches, uh, page 327. I'm going to make this a little bigger. You will need to make straight paths for your feet, lest the lame be turned out of the way. We are surrounded by the lame and halting in the faith. And you are to help them, not by halting yourselves, but by standing like men who have been tried and proven in principle firm as a rock. I know that a work must be done for the people or many will not be prepared to receive the light of the angel sent down from heaven to lighten the whole earth with his glory. This is the second angel's message arriving again in our history. Right. We place that at 9-11. And, and we know that that, that we're in that time. Okay. Do not think that you will be found as vessels unto honor in the time of the latter reign to receive the Lord glory of God. If you are lifting up your souls unto vanity, speaking perverse things in secret, cherishing roots of bitterness, the frown of God will certainly be upon every soul who cherishes these roots of dissension. And possesses a spirit so unlike 
the spirit of Christ. That spirit is a spirit that is common to Adventism, to this movement, to us. It's not something where we can just look at someone else. We need to look at ourselves here. The angel who unites in the proclamation of the third message is to lighten the whole earth with with his glory. A work of worldwide extent, an unwanted power is here brought to view. The Advent movement of 1840 to 44 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. So that's August 11th, 1840 to October 22, 1844. That's 1,533 days. The first message was carried to every mission sta- missionary station in the world. And in this country, now when I say here, of course, we know that um, uh, that this is including the first and second angels message, by the way. Um, the first message was carried to every missionary station in the world. And in this country, there was the greatest religious interest which had been witnessed in any land since the Reformation of the 16th century. But these are to be far exceeded by the mighty movement under the loud cry of the third message. The work will be similar to that of the day of Pentecost. Servants of God with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration, hasten from place to place to proclaim the warning from heaven by thousands of voices all over the earth. The message will be given. Miracles are wrought. The sick are healed and signs and wonders follow the believers. Satan also works with lying wonders, even bringing down fire from heaven in the sight of men. Thus, the inhabitants of the earth are brought to take their stand. Now, somebody commented on a a video from last night, actually, in three of the the groups that I have in Facebook is where they commented. And. And there's somebody who has rejected certain aspects of Adventism. Uh, One is dealing with the close of probation. Now, when God closes probation, it is not an arbitrary act. We talked last night about um, um, those who um, were thinking that somehow just magically probation was going to close. And in November 9th, they were all suddenly going to be righteous. Um, And we know that that that's a wrong idea about the close of probation. God does not arbitrarily close probation on people. When he he declares, let him that is righteous be righteous still. He is just declaring what is. And when he declares him that is filthy will be filthy still. He's just declaring what is. What brings people to that polarization is a proclamation of a message that is described here with thousands of voices all over the earth revealing Christ's character, his glory, and miracles being wrought that are life-changing. And then we have Satan in contrast with his message and every person that God declares as righteous, will have made a choice and demonstrated this and will be prepared to stand in the sight of the holy God without a mediator. All those that God declares as filthy, as unrighteous, all of the plagues will not change them from their unrighteousness. They will have no desire to be in heaven with God's people. And so we can see that when God judges the heart, because it's not going to necessarily be evident to us who are who are saved and who are lost, especially when we look at people in the past, little children that died, uh, people that died. And, and we think, well, they weren't really truly a Christian. But yet God knows the heart. He is not the investigative judgment is not so much that God himself can figure out who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost. Right. Because God knows the end from the beginning. This is a process for us. It's an examination. It's a judgment, which the 144,000 will go over those books and examine all of this and recognize that God's judgment was just. And all of the wicked 
um, at the great white throne judgment as everything in their life and the history that, that of, of this world is revealed to them, they will recognize that God's judgment was just. Okay. So, um, and that, that, uh, this passage here, you know, thousands of voices all over the earth, the message will be given, right? Um, Servants of God with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration will hasten from place to place to proclaim the warning from heaven. Um, and there's other quotes like this as well. Uh, show that God takes the work into his own hands. This was the thing back in the upper room when I studied this. I recognized that the work that was going to be accomplished at the end of time was not going to be a work after man's order, but after God's order. When God's people are converted. The work that the church has been doing ever since its organization, even though it was placed there by God, is impotent. It's not able to accomplish this work that has to be done for Christ to return. The church will never accomplish that in the way that it has tried to do this. God has to take the work into his own hands. It is to the thirsting soul that the fountain of living waters is open. God declares, I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. To souls that are earnestly seeking for light and that accept with gladness every ray of divine illumination from his holy word, to such alone light will be given. It is through these souls that God will reveal that light and power which will lighten the earth with his glory. So what's going to lighten the earth? It's going to be this divine illumination that is received by those who are earnestly seeking for light and accept every ray. It's through these souls that God will reveal that light and power, which will lighten the whole earth with his glory, right? So an amazing thing. Uh, While I was praying at the family altar, the Holy Ghost fell upon me and I seemed to be rising higher and higher, far above the dark world. I, I turned to look for the Advent people in the world, but could not find them. When a voice said to me, look again and look a little higher. At this, I raised my eyes and saw a straight and narrow path cast up high above the world. On this path, the Advent people were traveling to the city, which was at the farther end of the path. They had a bright light set up behind them at the beginning of the path, which an angel told me was the midnight cry. This light shone all along the path and gave light for their feet so that they might not stumble. So we're all familiar with this quote, I hope. If they kept their eyes fixed on Jesus, who was just before them, leading them to the city, they were safe. But soon some grew weary And said the city was a great way off and they expected to have entered it before. And then Jesus would encourage them by raising his glorious right arm. And from his arm came a light which waved over the Advent band and they shouted, Hallelujah. Others rashly denied the light behind them and said it was not of God that had led, it was not God that had led them out so far. The light behind them went out, leaving their feet in perfect darkness. And they stumbled and lost sight of the mark and of Jesus and fell off the path down into the dark and wicked world below. We have to be careful that we do not rashly deny the light that God has given from the midnight cry. We know that the message of July 18th, November 9th, December 25th, March 27th, That that light that has given us these lines was God. It is the light of the midnight cry. This light of the midnight cry we know is, is, is the foundation of this, of Adventism, like of this message, right? So the light of the midnight cry leads us to October 22nd, 1844. It's, it's the end of the 2300 days and it leads us to the sanctuary, the cleansing of the sanctuary. And we know that the sanctuary in connection with the 2300 days is the foundation and central pillar of Adventism, correct? And the midnight cry leads us to that understanding. If we reject the light of the midnight cry, 
Will we accept the 2300 days and the sanctuary message? You can see when the church has rejected that light, that they've gone into darkness. But as individuals, we have to be very, very cautious about what we reject. What we think to be not of God when it was of God. That's 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 the blasphemy. That's the unforgivable sin to reject light that God has so clearly that you would clearly at one time accept it. But now you reject it because that light can't again affect you. And if God has given you all light. And you've rejected it, there is nothing that God can give you that you can then that can then change you and make you see things differently. Now, this statement uh, from Christ Object Lessons, page 127, uh, 721, right? If you go backwards, July 21st, midnight. In every age, there is a new development of truth, a message of God to the people of that generation. The old truths are all essential. New truth is not independent of the old, but an unfolding of it. It is only as the old truths are understood that we can comprehend the new. When Christ desired to open to his disciples the truth of his resurrection, he began at Moses and all the prophets and expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Luke 24, 27. But it is the light which shines in the fresh unfolding of truth that glorifies the old. He who rejects or neglects the new does not really possess the old. For him, it loses its vital power and becomes but a lifeless form. So when we look at the first and second angel's messages, that Millerite history, um, we know as Seventh-day Adventists, we often speak of the third angel's message and its proclamation. That means that there must be two other messages in order there to be a third, right? And are these messages important? Are these messages to be repeated? Can we proclaim the third angel's message if we do not understand the first and second? So many Seventh-day Adventists talk about the three angels, and we used to have the three angels as a symbol, and they still kind of are in the new emblem or whatever you want to call it. Um, so they don't really look like angels. They're just, you know, three things going around the planet. But um, uh, the three angels' messages, that's what Adventism is about. But how many Adventists know when the first and second angels' messages were given? How many Adventists understand what those messages were? Very few. And very few today even know about the three angels' messages. And, and many talk about the third, of course, right? You know, righteousness by faith and verity. But without an understanding and an experience in the first and second angels' messages, we can't experience the third. It just becomes to us a lifeless theory, something that we debate and argue about. Nate, Christ's nature, can we overcome sin or not? All those types of things. That's not what the third angel's message is. It is an experience uh, that is given uh, because of following through this three-step testing prophetic message. Okay, so the first angel's message, we're just going to quickly go over these. Um, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, kindred and tongue, and people, saying, with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Now we take this three steps. Fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. And that's definitely the three steps that we can see is embodied in this first message. It's all three messages. And, and we can see that then that third step, worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters connected to the judgment, is showing that this is about the Sabbath, right? That's 
one of the things we understand about the three angels' messages is that in the first message, we have this message about the Sabbath, and that's tied to the judgment. Now, why why do I say that? Because, you know, a person could look at this statement and say, well, fear God, that's number one. Give glory to him, that's number two. For the hour his judgment has come is number three. And worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountain of waters, that's number four. And that we could say, well, that's the fourth angel's message. That's going to be the Sabbath test. But I'm saying that that's connected to the judgment is come. Right. So in a sense, you could say it is the fourth message. But why do I say it's attached to the third? This worship him that made heaven and earth to see in the fountains of waters, quoting from uh, the fourth commandment. You understand the question? How is the Sabbath tied to the day of atonement? To to the day of judgment. I don't want to answer the question for you. What does the Sabbath represent? Okay, because of the three talks about the mark of the beast. Only a holy person can keep the Sabbath holy. The Sabbath is a sign between us and God that he's the Lord that sanctifies us, right? He's our sanctification. Could we pass the judgment without being sanctified? The Sabbath represents this perfection of God's character in man. The first Sabbath, Adam and Eve are um, in complete fellowship with God, right? So without this, without this complete connection with God, knowing God, we came to the judgment, uh, we would we would not be able to pass. And of course, when we know about this judgment, I mean, this judgment um is the judgment of those that claim to believe in Christ. Those are, they've gone through those steps of justification, sanctification, and now judgment. And that's the glorification. Okay, so we know that this message came into history at the time of 1798, right? So this first angel's message. Uh, the first angel's message embodies the messages that follow it. So we just talked about that. And this three-step process is written into every reformatory movement. And it's also part of our personal experience. We all experience these, these steps. Um, and, and they're revealed in creation as well in, in Genesis chapter 1. Now, the second angel's message follows. So there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, we know that wine represents doctrine. And we know that Babylon is fallen. And now in the second angel's message, uh, we know in Millerite history, they made a call to come out of Babylon. Now, now, should they have made the call to come out of Babylon based upon the second angel's message? Is there is there here in this verse a call to come out of Babylon? Yeah, so we don't see it. It's going to be in the chapter 18. And and the way the pioneers understood it, once they understood the fall of Babylon and the call to come out of Babylon, is they actually placed both the second angel of Revelation 14, verse 8, and the angel of Revelation 18 in their time, right? Obviously, they're not going to look at the Revelation 18 as some future time. So they tied it all together. So there was a call to come out of Babylon. But it wasn't based upon this verse. It was based upon Revelation 18. And um, so with this Babylon is fallen in Millerite history, there is a call. And and people are called to make a stand to show which side they're on. In our personal lives, um, you know, we first come to Christ. We see ourselves as a sinner. In the second angel's message is, is the part where we now become a witness we start to show by our choices of friends and things that we do, uh, which side we are on, that we're no longer of the world, that we've been called out of the world, right? So um, I talked a bit here about, you know, the 500,000 and the 50,000 and then the 50, right? So that's going to happen later. Um, so those that did not remain faithful came to constitute Babylon. So the Protestants were tested by this first angel's message 
and they failed that test. The Protestant church has rejected the message for the most part, and uh, they now constituted Babylon. They had could not receive any more light. And that's why when we think about the study last night, we think about all these Protestants who are writing about righteousness by faith and justification by faith in the 1880s, 90s, and the early 1900s, that our church leaders say, well, they were teaching the same message as Jones and Wagner. This is apostate Protestantism. They can't have the light of the third angel. They cannot understand righteousness by faith in verity because they've rejected the first angel's message. Um, So this is also connected with the proclamation of the message, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him in the summer of 1844, that the call to come out of Babylon was first given. So you're going to have the call to come out of Babylon happening in that same summer. And and this is the true midnight cry. It is the light of this message that shines all along our path that our feet may not stumble and that leads us to the heavenly city. So you can see if you don't accept the second angel's message that you're going to be deceived by the teachings of Protestantism and those teachings that exist within our church. So if you don't understand the first and second angel's message, it's not possible for you to receive the third and to stand in the Sunday law test. Ellen White says the proclamation of the first and second angels messages has been located by the word of inspiration. Not a peg or a pin is to be removed. No human authority has any more right to change the location of these messages than to substitute the New Testament for the Old. The Old Testament is the gospel in figures and symbols. The New Testament is the substance. One is as essential as the other. The Old Testament presents from the lips of Christ, uh, presents lessons from the lips of Christ, and these lessons have not lost their force in any particular. The first and second messages were given in 1843 and 44, and we are now under the proclamation of the third, but all three three of the messages are still to be proclaimed. It is just as essential now as ever before, that they shall be repeated to those who are seeking for the truth. By pen and voice, we are to sound the proclamation, showing their order and the application of the prophecies that bring us to the third angel's message. There cannot be a third without the first and second. These messages are to give to the world, we are to give to the world in publications and discourses, showing in the line of prophetic history the things that have been and the things that will be. Okay. <clears throat> now, the third angel's message, which, of course, I'm doing studies on these on Friday nights, so there's going to obviously be lots of overlap uh, to last night's study and, and also to Dwight's study uh, today. Um, so when we think about the topic here, the law of liberty, Right. So this is what the study has been on. And we're looking at these messages. We get to the third angel's message. So we've dealt with it in a lot of detail in the Friday night studies. But we'll read read the verse and we will talk about it. Uh, The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice. If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture undiluted right into the cup of his indignation and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whoso receiveth the mark of his name here is the patience of the saints here are they that keep the commandments of god and the faith of Jesus. So when we look about that, that this, and we think about this as righteousness by faith, um, it doesn't seem readily evident that, that this message is righteousness by faith and verity in the way that people understand what the message of righteousness by faith is. But if you understand it as this, the test, the, 
this test that demonstrates the two classes of worshipers, I think it becomes much more readily evident. You're going to see those that are going to be uh, destroyed by the God's wrath and those who have persevered and reflect Christ's character. So we see two opposing principles at work. Worship of the beast in his image is contrasted with fearing and keeping God's commandments. The proclamation of this message is connected with the final test of loyalty. Man will either accept the principles that underlie the persecution of those who follow God, or he will be the persecuted. Um, I think I should have had persecutor. Anyway, I make typos. Under the first, there is a rejection of God's law and the principle of the cross. Under the second, there is an acceptance of the principles of underlying God's government. Those who keep God's commandments recognize that freedom comes from obedience. Right. So that should be pretty clear based on the studies that we have had. So now we have another angel. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power. And the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of the fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. <clears throat> now, remember, I, when I presented this sermon, I, I presented it at, at my church in Warburg, Seventh-day Adventist Church. So I, I was presenting this message to people who weren't in this movement, for the most part. Uh, in our time, there's a repeat of all three messages, specifically. We see that the other angel that comes and lightens the earth with his glory uses the language of the second angel's message. Right. So that's something we know. And this makes sense in that the second angel's message parallels the glory of God. Right. Fear God. Give glory to him. Right. It is the test of the people of God that precedes the close of judgment for the world. This means that prior to the second angel's message, the first must be proclaimed. So this passage here, um, we've spent time studying. This is um, written in August 16th, 1900. It's manuscript 59. It's from a, uh, it's entitled Jots and Tittles number two. Um, Kind of interesting title to this. Now, this, of course, is about Revelation chapter 10. So we've spent some time looking at this. Uh, so in Revelation chapter 10, we're going to have the seven thunders under their voices, right? And John is going to be told to seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered. But how much time do I have? Yes, I'm not going to read this whole thing and go through this in detail. Um, but what we need to read here is this paragraph. The books of Daniel and Revelation are one. One is a prophecy. The other, a revelation. One is a book sealed. The other, a book opened. John heard the mysteries which the seven thunders uttered, but he was commanded not to write them. The special light given to John, which was expressed in the seven thunders, was the delineation of events, that is, events set upon a line which would transpire or unfold um, under the first and second angel's messages. It was not best for the people to know these things, for their faith must necessarily be tested. In the order of God, most wonderful and advanced truths would be proclaimed. The first and second angel's messages were to be proclaimed, but no further light was to be revealed before these messages had done their specific work. This is represented by the angel standing with one foot on the sea, proclaiming with the most solemn oath that time should be no longer. So 
Um, so in here, the main thing that we can see is that under the first and second angel's messages, you have these seven thunders, which are a delineation of events uh, that are going to be sealed up. And they're unsealed in the repeat of history that is in our time, not in post, you know, 1844 to 1850 or in that time of the, of the development of the Adventist church are these thunders unsealed, which is what I would have thought in the past that they were unsealed, you know, as they experienced their disappointment, but no, their experience, the understanding of Millerite history has not occurred until our time. Even the pioneers did not fully understand the history that they passed through. Can, can we accept that? That we have a better understanding today of their history, the Millerite history, than those that passed through it. Is that too bold of a statement? Well, I would say so. You think it's too bold, or you think it's no, okay? I think it's okay. Yeah. Okay. We, it, it, is, it is a bold statement. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, that's okay. You go on. I'll just say we could see things that they didn't see. You know, clearly. Right. And 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 when we think about it, um, Ezra, when he travels from uh, Babylon to Jerusalem, and you know. All of that history of that first year, 457 BC, the first year of the that where we start uh, the 2300 days in the 70 weeks. He could not possibly have understood that those events in 457, those dates would have significance in 1844. So even though Ezra went through that history, we understand the significance of that history more than Ezra did. Because of our repeat of history, we can look back at what happened in Millerite history and understand it in ways that the Millerites could not have understood. For one is they didn't connect 457 BC to 1844 with these dates in the way that we have. They did understand the first day of the first month and the first day of the fifth month to some degree in, in 457, but they never saw that, you know, the first day of the fifth month was when the midnight cry occurred in, in Exeter on August 15th, right? They didn't think, hey, this is the first day of the fifth month, right? So they understood it to some degree in Miller in, in 457, but not how it related to 1844. But we can see that. So that means in our history, these seven thunders have been unsealed. And this is pretty amazing because the people who understand that they're unsealed are insignificant, unimportant, scattered individuals throughout the world that nobody cares about. And God's given us this light to give to the world, to understand the 2300 days and the 70 weeks in ways that they have never been understood before. That's primarily what our message is about. So just some conclusions, and this is very broad here, but we, we see then that love is the fulfilling of the law, right? It is a choice between freedom from sin and, or bondage to sin. The last message to be given to the world is a living revelation of the righteousness of Christ. And if the Son, therefore, make, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. These are the conclusions of these studies. So we need to recognize that this message that we have is really about God's love and us demonstrating God's love to others in spite of the conflicts and all those things, all the criticisms, the persecution, whatever happens, that God's love is always going to be revealed, that we're not going to retaliate <clears throat> like a lamb to a slaughter. We will not open our mouths, right? We will accept whatever happens to us and reveal Christ's character in so doing. No matter how hard or how painful that experience is, it is to God's glory and it is to our salvation as well and the salvation of those around us that we love and care for. 
Our hearts need to be changed. We are unconverted. We do not reflect Christ in character. We definitely do not have a character that can stand uh, this test. And God is preparing us. But we can't just think that we are sufficient, that what we know and what we've experienced is significant. And so when we study, we're not studying just to get a bunch of intellectual knowledge. We're not studying these things because we want to be in the know so that we can uh, argue with others or show others that we're intelligent or anything like that. We're studying these things because we want to be changed. We want to be loving. We want to be able to show love to our enemies, not just to our friends. And the love that can change others. Not all of our enemies are going to be converted just because we love them. But the fact that we love our enemies will definitely have an effect on how others uh, see the message that we are giving. If we are to understand this message, we need to we need to recognize it's a message meant to change us. Otherwise, there's no point in even studying it. If we're just going to stay the same as we have been, then the message is more like an albatross around our neck than anything. So let's close in prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for what you teach us. The experiences that we have passed through, the disappointments, the discouragements, uh, the anguish and pain um, that we can feel because you have put in our hearts the ability to love. We know, Lord, as we accept the light of your message and as we change into that uh, character of Christ, that our love becomes greater and our suffering becomes greater. We know, Lord, that... um, You have a work to do in us and we submit our hearts to you, submit our lives to you. And we ask that you can bless our time in personal study, that this Sabbath can be a blessing, that your will can be done. Bring us together again tomorrow morning to study and, and other days as well. And I pray, Lord, in in this season that Christ can be born in us. Thank you for hearing our prayer. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.